so halle, hallel, luya, praise you, Yahweh. We praise you this morning, and we ask you, Lord God, to speak your word. It's in his name, in Jesus' name, that we pray, amen. Hey, these are uh, announcements taken from actual church bulletins, okay? The sermon this morning, Jesus walks on the water. The sermon tonight, searching for Jesus. (laughs) The eighth graders will be presenting Shakespeare's Hamlet in the church basement Friday at 7 p.m. The congregation is invited to attend this tragedy. Mrs. Johnson will be entering the hospital this week for testes. Low self, I like this one. Low self-esteem support group will meet Thursday at 7 p.m. Please use the back door. (laughs) Then there's the next song. Angels we have heard get high. (laughs) This being Easter Sunday, we will ask Mrs. Lewis to come forward and lay an egg on the altar. So why do you laugh? Because you did laugh. I mean, do you take Easter seriously? Do angels really get high? Are things like low self-esteem, sickness, tragedy, and sin funny? Don't you take God seriously? Galatians 6, 7, God is not mocked. One more. A bean supper will be held on Tuesday evening in the church hall. Music will follow. And and that actually reminds me of something I actually saw, witnessed it years ago in a worship service at a revival meeting. As everyone was worshiping, I noticed this group of well-put-together church ladies sitting a few rows in front of us. And uh, as they were sitting there worshiping, one of them started to laugh. And And then another started laughing at her laughter, and then the first one kind of lost control and made some music, which made the other one laugh more, which led to more laughing and more music uh, until uh, one after another, these well-together church ladies, I watched them like fall off their chairs onto the floor, uh, rolling around in this vortex of like laughter and wind. Seriously, the weirdest thing I've ever seen in church, and nobody seemed to be offended, or to hardly even notice, but people who heard about this sort of manifestation of the Spirit, the wind, sure seemed to be offended. They called it the laughing revival, and they said it was a mockery of God. Genesis 17, 15, and God said to 99-year-old Abraham, Remember, we spoke about him last week, many years before this. For no apparent reason, God just decides to bless Abraham with a promise that in him, in him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall, know, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, No. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring, literally his seed after him. So Abraham laughs at the word of God. Short time later, Genesis 18, verse 1, And the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. As he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. Three men, and check this out, one of these men is called Yahweh. He's addressed as Yahweh. That's kind of interesting, huh? Like a God-man. Verse 9, they said to him, where is Sarah your wife? These three in one. Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. 
the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? Literally, shall I have Eden? I love that. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, because she was afraid. He said, no, you did laugh. Sarah laughs, and the God-man says, Sarah, why'd you laugh? Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did you laugh? Maybe God is pointing out that Sarah, and possibly Abraham, who also laughed, you remember, just don't take them all that seriously. If uh, they don't take God seriously, why is that? Well, it's because they take themselves seriously, right? Their, their old bodies, their experiences, they, they take those things entirely too seriously. They may actually think that some things are too hard for God. And if so, they laugh at God. They mock God. Don't mock God. If you come to the Lord's table, for instance, and you think to yourself, there's no way that God would die for me, love me, pursue me, sacrifice himself for me, give himself to me, and you chuckle, you're laughing at God. Don't mock God. How dare you tell God what he cannot do? I mean, seriously. How dare you take yourself more seriously than God? Is anything too hard for the Lord? You know, the sanctuary exists because we dared to answer no. Actually, nothing is impossible with God. After a scary comment about rich people in the Gospels, the disciples asked Jesus, who then can be saved? Do you remember what his answer was? With man, this salvation is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Years ago at a conference in Oxford, England, on the topic of apologetics, someone brought up the idea of a grace that's strong enough to save all, and it seemed to insult the famous theologian that was leading our seminar. So I raised my hand and, I'd say, and I said, would you say that it's impossible for God to save all? And trapped, knowing that he was trapped, he said, well, no, I wouldn't say it's impossible. But I sure wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> and, then, and then I remember, I, I think he, he laughed. If he wouldn't bet on grace, what would he be betting on? Himself? And if he thinks salvation is too hard for God, isn't he mocking God? Because what is God? God is salvation. That's what Scripture says. Old Testament and New Testament's name is Jesus. Isn't hell reserved for those that mock God? That laugh at God until they learn to laugh with God and at their own arrogant ego. Proud people mock. They laugh other people down, and it's not real laughter. Only humble people can actually <laughs> laugh. So the God-man asks, why'd you laugh, Sarah? Bride of Christ, why do you laugh? Do you mock the word of God? Genesis 21, verse 1, the Lord visited Sarah as he said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac, Itzhak, from Tzahak. Remember, God already told Abraham, you will call him Isaac. And I neglected to tell you that Isaac, Itzhak, in Hebrew means he laughs. From Tzahak, meaning to laugh. So then the child of the promise, listen closely, the promised seed is literally named laughs or laughter by, by God. He's a good laugh. 
And after 25 years of trying, don't you think Abraham and Sarah desperately needed a good laugh? How about you? After 25 years of striving, failure, sadness, trying to, you know the story, right? Trying to finagle, trying to engineer the blessing. After 25 years of being humbled over and over and having the flesh cut away from them over and over and over again. After 25 years of waiting for the promise, they laugh. Sahak over Itzhak, born through old Sarah and to Abraham when he was in the words of St. Paul, quote, good as dead. Genesis 21, 4. And Abraham circumcised his son, Esau. That's cut the flesh away. You understand. When he was eight days old, eight's important, as God had commanded him, Abraham was 100 years old when his son, Esau, was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made Sahok from Sahak. He's made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh, Sahak, over me. And she said, who would have said that to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children. Yet I've borne him a son in his old age. See, that's, that's kind of funny. And who made laughter for Sarah? God. Nine months before, she made her own laughter. And it wasn't real laughter. It was imitation laughter, mockery, and God is not mocked. And how did God make laughter? Well, with, his, with the only begotten son, right? Born in this place of desperation, God is not mocked. And yet, Jesus, the only begotten son of God, was mocked in, in a place of desolation, wasn't he? Which is just something to think about. But now Abraham and Sarah aren't laughing at God, but with God at themselves over this blessing. Sarah says, everyone who hears will laugh, Sahak, over me. Who will laugh? Everyone. Everyone that hears. And that's a lot of folks, because Abraham, remember, is blessed to be a blessing to all the families of the Adamah, the, the ground, the dust, the thing Adam is made out of. They will laugh, not at God, but with God and at themselves, at their fears, their arrogance, their doubts, their ego, their desolation, their unbelief. They will laugh at the blessing. And the name of the blessing is laughter. That's like a vortex of laughter. They will no longer take themselves so seriously because they take God and his promise so seriously. They will laugh in faith by grace at grace with grace. They take God so seriously that they no longer take themselves seriously like at all. Soren Kierkegaard taught that laughter marks the boundary between legalism and the revelation of grace. In other words, it's the boundary of faith. Charles Schultz wrote, humor is proof of faith. Karl Barth wrote, laughter is man's humble reaction to the amazing and ridiculous fact of man being a recipient of God's honor. Laughter is the closest thing to the grace of God. And I would add the closest thing to the bosom of 99-year-old Sarah as she nursed laughter, literally nursed the laughter that God made for her and in her and through her. You see, I suspect that those ladies rolling around on the church floor in front of us in Toronto, Canada, Canada, I think they were laughing like old Sarah. They laughed because they knew that the promised one was with them. And the more they took him seriously, the less they could take themselves seriously. They saw the Christ child and they laughed at his manger themselves. You realize that you can't serve two masters, right? So either you will take God seriously and laugh at everything else, including yourself. Or you'll take yourself seriously and laugh at everything else, including God. So do you take God seriously and laugh at yourself, kind of like a fool for his sake? Or do you take yourself seriously and laugh at God? You know, he goes by different names, right? Like truth, beauty, faith, hope, love. Do those things seem foolish to you? 
I think it's why they often do seem foolish to me. It's why I often want to quit preaching, why I want to give in to despair, why I'm proud of, proud of myself, and why I think I never measure up. It's why I worry. It's why I accuse myself and then accuse my name. It's why I sin. I take myself so stinking seriously. And God, not so much, if at all. St. Simeon of Salas was the first saint to be officially recognized by the early church as a holy fool, to be followed uh, by many others, including St. Francis of Assisi. Simeon, though, was a 6th century Palestinian monk who practiced great acts of, um, great acts of compassion in, in secret, but made a fool of himself in, in public. On more than one occasion, he was kicked out of church for throwing nuts at the altar candles. He would often defecate in public. His last visit to church was a Good Friday. As the priest admonished the faithful to, quote, mortify the flesh in honor of Christ, that is to take one's own ego very lightly because you take the grace of God extremely seriously. As the priest admonished the faithful to mortify the flesh, St. Simeon pulled out a large sausage and just started eating it. While they were dragging him out of the church for the last time, he said, the essence of human sinfulness is to take ourselves and our own rituals too seriously. So why don't we walk on water? Why don't we turn water into wine and move mountains with faith? Why don't we sell all of our possessions, pick up a cross and follow him wherever he goes? Why don't we preach the gospel with boldness and then lay down our lives, willing to be persecuted and reviled for those that, that hate us? Why don't we forgive us we've been forgiven? Why don't we laugh at everything the devil says? Isn't it because we take ourselves so stinking seriously and Jesus not seriously? Like maybe at all. We forget that we each are like that foolish manger in Bethlehem. And yet that manger holds the very word and will of God. Brennan Manning was stuck at the airport in Chicago two weeks before Christmas. All flights had been canceled. He, he was set to preach the next day in, in Texas. It was just chaos and pandemonium. And, and, and he used to say directly across from him, I remember him t telling this, uh, sat this uh, woman, a middle-aged, uh, apparently poor, uneducated woman, holding a child and just laughing. She looked up and caught him staring, and he said, Ma'am, every other person here tonight is miserable. Would you mind telling me why you're so happy? Sure, she said. Christmas is coming. And that baby Jesus, he make me laugh. Isaiah 54. Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. So your desolate old self will give birth to your new and eternal self, who isn't simply just yourself, but Christ in you and an entire new creation. I think that will be rather hilarious if you take the gospel seriously and your le yourself less seriously. Hilarious. Otherwise... Perhaps utterly terrifying. G.K. Chesterton wrote, Angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. See, angels, they get high. This has been always the instinct of Christendom and especially the instinct of Christian art. Every figure seems ready to fly up and float about in the heavens. The tattered cloak of the beggar will bear him up like the rayed plumes of the angels. But the kings in their heavy gold and the proud in their robes of purple will all of their nature sink downwards. For pride cannot rise to levity or levitation. Pride is the downward drag of all things into an easy solemnity. Solemnity flows out of men naturally, but laughter is a leap. It's easy to be heavy. 
It's hard to be light. Satan fell by force of gravity. And I know this. Satan takes himself incredibly seriously. He's perpetually offended. He cannot in the least bit take a joke or laugh at himself, even though or, or maybe because his self is really nothing but illusions. The shadow can only mock, writes J.R.R. Tolkien. It cannot make. If the seed of Abraham is the promised blessing and the promised blessing is the word of God, then it would seem that all things are made and sustained somehow by laughter, with laughter. For the name of the seed of Abraham is laughter. 1964, my mom took me to see my very first uh, motion picture. I sat through it twice because of its profound spiritual impact upon me at the age of three. This particular scene is a beautiful picture, I think, of the kingdom of God. When Uncle Albert laughs, and by the way, this chapter in in the book is titled Laughing Gas, but when Uncle Albert laughs, he floats to the ceiling and he can't get down. So Mary Poppins, Bert, Jane, and Michael, they rush to his aid, and and they laugh to the ceiling with him, and Mary Poppins provides the meal, and they all commune floating together on the ceiling. Children, will you please sit up properly at the table? Your tea, Uncle Albert. Oh, thank you, my dear. I'm having such a good time. I wish that you could all stay up here all the time. Well, Jolly, we'll have to. There's no way to get down. Oh, no, there is a way. Frankly, I, I don't like to mention it because you have to think it's something sad. Then do get on with it, please. Let me see. I've got the very thing. Yesterday, when the lady next door answered the bell, there was a man there. And the man said to the lady, I'm terribly sorry. I just ran over your cat. Oh, that's sad. The poor cat. And then the man said, I'd like to replace your cat. And the lady said, that's all right with me, but how are you at catching mice? (laughs) 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 Well, you know, I start out sad. I I try, really, I do, but but everything ends up so hilarious. I can't (laughs) get out. Uncle Albert kind of reminds me of Glenn, if you ever talked to Glenn before the service. Satan fell by force of gravity, but they rise in a communion of laughter. I try, says Uncle Albert, but everything ends up so hilarious. Now, you might think to yourself, okay, Uncle Albert, fine, but what if you're the cat? And okay, preacher boy, this this is a nice idea, but... I don't live in a Disney movie. I live in a world where millions of babies are aborted on demand, where millions of men who say they care about those babies rape women, break their marriage vows, and then abuse those women while passing laws against those women. I live in a world where Palestinians will rape and murder and enslave 1,500 Israelis, and then Israel and her allies will systematically slaughter 40,000 Palestinians. I live in a world where every child of Adam would and did nail the only good man that ever lived to a tree in a garden on the top of Mount Moriah. I live in a world where every living thing dies. And you dare quote Uncle Albert to me? I try, but everything ends up so hilarious. How about I try and everything dies? Yep. (laughs) I hear you. And it's why I struggle at preaching the gospel. And why I so often really just feel like a fool. So, so maybe I need to remind all of us of a surprising development in the story of the boy named Laughter. Genesis 17, God says to Abraham, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Esau. You shall call his name Laughter, 
Genesis 21, Sarah said, God has made Sahok laughter for me. Genesis 21, 12, God says, uh, through Isaac shall your offspring, your seed, be named. Genesis 22, God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac. Take laughter whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, there is a satanic notion that God hates what is sacrificed to him. And a satanic notion that God must hate something in order to love you. But what is sacrificed to God in Scripture is an offering to God. God calls it holy. He doesn't hate Isaac or Abraham or Sarah. And he doesn't need you to give anything to him in order to love you. But maybe you need to watch him give something to you in order for you to love him. So, so what God asks Abraham to offer, now think about this, is absolutely everything that God has already given to Abraham. It's literally Abraham's life and laughter. And it's everything that God has still promised to give Abraham, his lineage. Genesis 21, 12, he already told Abraham, through Isaac will your seed be named. So kill Isaac and you kill the seed. And who's the seed? Through Isaac will your seed be named and now offer him to me on the mountain that I show you. Why would God do that? I don't know that I can say this exactly correctly. I'm sure I can't, actually. But I think it has something to do with laughter. I mean, have you ever really laughed? I mean, not mocked, but you know, from like the depths of your being, just from the deepest part of your belly, you just couldn't help it, just ha, laughed uncontrollably. Doesn't laughter have something to do with distance? It has to do with the distance between confusion, right, the setup for the joke, and illumination. Between chaos and order, darkness and light, evil and good, between death and life, between non-being and being, between I am not and I am, between absence and presence, between despair and hope. In our study of Romans, we said that hope is faith for the distance. So if you have no hope, you have no faith in love. And so you mock those that do have hope that love will cover the distance. In other words, you judge them and you laugh at them, but it's a fake laugh. Why? Because you've seized control of laughter. But if you hope in love, and God is love, you have prepared yourself for laughter. For hope is the faith that love will cover the distance. In, in other words, faith is surrendering your laughter, your Isaac, to love. And God is love. You see, your heart knows that laughter is the revelation of grace. Or a response to the revelation of grace. And, and grace, by definition, is not what you do, but what love does to you and in you and through you. God is love, and laughter, real laughter, is surrendering your life to love. And this is why I'm not telling you to go home and practice laughing. Because that's what religion does, right? Go home, stand in front of the mirror, make yourself laugh. Ha, 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 ha. Keep laughing until you believe it. Make yourself laugh. Try harder. See, that's like saying to a woman, make yourself pregnant, Sarah. Try harder. It's like saying to a man, well, bless yourself, Abraham. Try harder. I'm not saying try harder to laugh, but if you're no longer laughing, stare at the baby in the manger, and he'll make you laugh. Have you ever played peekaboo with a baby? 
Have you? When I think back on it now, it almost seems mean. And yet I did it over and over and over again with each one of my babies. And, and then they began to do it with me. Because you see, at a certain age, the baby discovers that you, the dad, exist and that you are more than just them, and it fills the baby with, with wonder. And, and at this age, you can hide your face, you can cover your face, and, and all the joy will just drain from your baby's face. They'll hold their breath in, in sorrow and, and fear. But when you reveal your face, flash a smile, they'll just squeal with delight. They'll surrender their breath, they'll laugh, and that's what laughter is. It's surrendered breath. Cover your face again. You haven't left them. You haven't forsaken them. But cover your face and, and they'll hold their breath in fear again. Then flash your face and they'll laugh again, but even louder. You, you see, the sorrow of your absence is more than filled with the joy of your manifest presence. And there's a word for that in Greek. It's parousia. Biblical terminology. Hello. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hello. Goodbye. Hello. One four. Well, Psalm one hundred four, verse twenty nine. When you hide your face, Lord, they are dismayed. When you withhold their breath. They die and return to their dust. When you send forth your breath, they are created. And you renew the face of the Adamah. God is playing peekaboo with Adam. That's us. Psychologists say that peekaboo is absolutely essential for the social development of a child because it teaches them object permanence. And you know who our dad is? I am that I am. Teaches them object permanence, and uh, it is the revelation somehow, uh, grace, it, the revelation of grace, the revelation of relentless love. So the experience of absence is not the absence of experience. In, in fact, the experience of absence creates space for faith and hope and love, that's, that's laughter. The absence is a temporal illusion and the presence is I am that I am. That is reality, the eternal ground of your being, your heavenly dad. Peekaboo with a baby. Play peekaboo with a baby and before long the baby will start playing peekaboo with you and you'll both start laughing at the continual revelation of love in one another and life is a communion of laughter. Scripture says that God is not mocked. I don't think that's because God has some kind of law against mocking him. I think that's because when you truly see him as he is, we will know, have no, no doubt that love covers the distance, that love does everything. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love will not be mocked. God is not mocked. However, Scripture repeatedly reveals that Jesus is mocked. Perhaps that's because Jesus is God hidden in human flesh in order to teach each one of us to laugh. In other words, he's the very breath of God that we hold on to in fear. And he is uh, the breath that we expire and inspire as faith. It takes faith to breathe. It was on the tree in the garden on Mount Moriah that Jesus said, Father, into your hands I surrender my breath. And I suspect that whenever a child of Adam truly laughs at the revelation of love, it's the exact same thing. It's Jesus surrendering our breath to God is faith. In Jesus, God descends into our sorrow and weeps with us there that we would rise with him and forever laugh with him in the eternal habitations. He said to his disciples, listen closely, a little while and you will see me no longer. And again a little while and you will see me. Sounds a lot like peekaboo, at least to me. 
And then he said this, truly, truly, I say to you, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that an Adam, a person, has been born into the world. In, in the words of Sarah, as her laughter went from mockery to joy, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. The Lord has made laughter for me. Maybe the Lord is always making laughter for you. Forming him in the womb of your sorrow and birthing him on the holy mountain. In other words, you can't make laughter. But you will give birth to laughter. And you can't contain the laughter because it's actually not your own. And so God said to Abram, you are blessed to be a blessing. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so, one fateful day, in obedience to God's command, when laughter was about 13 years old, when laughter was Abraham's very life and joy, Abraham, the father of faith, rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took Isaac with him. And on the third day, says Genesis, he saw the place. He saw Mount Moriah, what we now call Mount Zion or Mount Calvary. He placed Isaac, his laughter, on the wood and lifted his knife, and God supplied the ram. That's a full-grown lamb. The author of Hebrews writes, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, Isaac offered up laughter. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac, through laughter, will your seed be named. He reasoned, Abraham reasoned, that God was able to raise him from the dead, that he was able to cover the distance. He reasoned that God was able to raise him from the dead, from which, as a parable, he did receive him back. So when Abraham offered Isaac to God, he offered his very own life, his, his very own life and laughter, and received him back as the deepest and most heartfelt of all laughter. And when God our Father offered up Jesus to us, he offered his very own life. And when Jesus in us, that is faith, hope, and love in us, offers our life back to God, we will experience ourselves as God's eternal laughter. In fear... We all hang on to our life, right? <gasps> Terrified to die. But when in faith we surrender our life, we'll discover that we aren't dying. We're being born. In fear we all hold our breath, and in faith we will all surrender it back to God as laughter. Expiration. <laughs> that turns into inspiration, that is expiration, and inspiration, and exp breathing without end, because it is the end, it's life eternal. Genesis 21, 12. I think you need to meditate on this verse, okay, for the rest of your days. Through Isaac, through Isaac, through laughter, will your seed be named. Who is Abraham's seed? Class, class, who's Abraham's seed? Yeah, and us, and, and the promised blessing is, right? Jesus, yeah, Jesus. It's uh, the answer to every children's sermon, Jesus. Yeshua, God is salvation, word of God, judgment of God, Jesus. And in Jesus is what? Well, Paul says the treasure of wisdom and knowledge, so like Jesus is like a treasure, a wisdom and knowledge pinata or something. Uh, he also wrote this, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Everything's in him. Jesus is literally the beginning, the end, and the way, so laughter is the way. Jesus is the revelation of the invisible God, our Abba, our Dad. So listen again, through laughter will Jesus be named. So to call on Jesus and to receive all things with him, you're going to have to learn to laugh. And you will only learn to laugh when you have learned to take yourself less seriously. For you take God entirely seriously. 
You will only live when you see that love has conquered the distance from darkness to light, from chaos to creation, from lies to truth, from hell to heaven, uh, from our fears to the glory of God our Father. In other words, you're saved by grace through faith, and this faith not of yourselves, lest any should boast, lest any should mock God and the grace of God. Try and mock him if you want. <laughs> Kill him. Crucify him. Consume him if you want, but he will get the last laugh. And when he does, it'll be coming right out of your belly. I hope you realize that the God-man who asked Sarah, why do you laugh, is her great, 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 great grandson. He's the promise growing inside her womb. So Mary Poppins serves biscuits and tea. And our God serves himself. And I think his name is Laughter. For on the night that he was betrayed by all of us, just before he was mocked by all of us, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of, of me. I will not drink again of this cup until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So, so what's my point? Maybe you think some things are just too hard for God. We need to know that nothing is too hard for God. And thinking that something is too hard for God is sin and death and despair. Maybe you have an empty place inside of you. You know, the pain of which is just too much to bear. And you wonder what God is doing. I don't know exactly, Sarah, but I'm convinced that God is making laughter for you and for all. Maybe God has made you a promise. But now it seems like he's asking you to lay it all down. Well, go ahead and do it, Abraham. Surrender your laughter, for hanging on to laughter is the death of laughter, but surrendering it is receiving it all back. It's life eternal. It's a tradition in the Greek Orthodox Church that the priests all get together like a pack of holy fools on the day after Easter, and they just tell jokes. And that's because they believe that Easter is like a cosmic joke that God pulled on Satan such that when the word of God was ingested by death and hell and chaos, he rose from that very place and turned all things into laughter. And you see, you don't have to wait for Easter. You can start laughing right here, right now. The light cups are juice, the dark cups are wine, they're both well, they're both the punchline, <laughs> literally, the logos, the reason, the meaning of all things. So, Lord God, we thank you that you are revealed in Jesus. In Jesus, you are the one that came to seek and save the lost and the one that never leaves the one behind. You're beautiful. And so, Lord God, we praise you for your beauty. We praise you for your goodness. And Lord God, I praise you that Jesus is the punchline of reality. <laughs> you win, and you're good. Thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, if you would, sit down for just a, just, I need. so funny. Oh. Well, thank you, Rick. Well, good. Thank you. I want you to sit down because I just need to tell you, um, God usually has me preach on the thing I most need to hear. And this week was uh, no different. Uh, this week I didn't feel like laughing because I realized that I needed to write you all a letter. So next week, I plan to send out this letter, and the letter is about two things, okay? Number one, I'm really excited to preach this new eight-week series of shorter, non-expositional sermons, okay? We'll do it for eight weeks. So these will be 
the topics. Hell, the elephant in the room, number one. This is starting September 8th. Number two, creation. Did God lose control of time? Number three, anthropology. Who is the Adam? Four, the fall, the doctrine of original ignorance. Number five, the judgment. There's only one. Number six, the atonement, the tree in the middle of the garden. Number seven, love and law, saved by free will, from free will, for free will. Number eight, eschatology, God is salvation, wins, and has always won. I'm excited about it because I think this is the foundation for really believing the simple gospel. That's simple, and that is that God is, uh, God is good and God wins. Uh, we'll begin that on September 8th. Next week, uh, Michael Heidel from Grand Junction, who's a pastor and comes here for church sometimes, is preaching. I'm really excited about what he's going to share. That's the first thing I need to write you about, and this is the second. Number two, as of mid-August, our cash balance here at the sanctuary is down to less than one month's operating expense. Last fall, I wrote you a letter, and like a ton of money came in. We gave the staff a cost of living increase, advanced several thousand dollars to our sister church down in the Philippines, and they bought a plot of land for a new church building. But since then, giving has slowed down. Didi sent out a letter a few months ago. It picked up. Then I said something in a sermon. It picked up some more. But we'll need that to continue, or we'll need to get real serious real soon about making cuts, moving, or maybe even shutting down. Number one, I think God has told me that we're not done yet. And by that, the sanctuary. By no means are you done. I think he's said that. I just don't know exactly what that, what that means. Number two, uh, if we were to move, we'd need to lease something else, like retail space. And we don't know how helpful that would be. Obviously, right now, we've got way more room than we need. Currently, our building costs are about 11 maybe 12% of our budget. So the building costs aren't that much because we have a $580,000 mortgage on this building, which you know is like a mortgage on a lot, of, a lot of houses. And it's a wonderful asset. And we don't know how much we could get for it, although we've asked for some estimates. We're set up to live stream here and to record. And that's important because by far, by far, by far, more people attend the sanctuary online than they do in person, and they attend in all sorts of places all around the world. We're hoping to host a conference here about 14 months from now and kind of already have it in the works. And so for several reasons, it would be rather painful to move. But, but I don't know exactly what God has for us. Number three, we could stay here and avoid cutting salaries and staff if giving increased on a consistent basis like it did in the last few months, if it just increased like, I don't know, maybe 10% or so. And so hopefully people online also hear that. That's why I'm saying this right, right now. But that's why this week I didn't feel like laughing. <laughs> Although I had already committed to preaching a sermon on laughter, and that just feels like the thing God would do to me. And this is why I feel like a fool. Because I can't seem to make things work. But if I ever thought that I could actually make things work, which I have at times, well, that's when I was really a fool. So this doesn't feel like a laughing matter, but that is exactly why this is a laughing matter. Anything that matters is a laughing matter, for by laughter is everything that's anything named, including the sanctuary. So I'm going to send out this letter about these two things. If you're on the mailing list, you'll get it. If you're not on the mailing list, you can get on the mailing list by going to the church website and signing up. I'm, I'm sending out a letter. Hopefully it's not too long. Hopefully it's what I just said. I'm going to send out the letter because um, I, want, I, I, want you, I want you to pay attention, but even more, I want you to laugh. I really mean that. I mean, I don't want you to stop laughing because you know that nothing is too hard for God. And because you know that God is making laughter for us. No matter what. No matter what happens to this institution or where we meet or where we don't meet. God is making laughter for us. And because it's only in laughter that we'll ever recognize who we truly are. Laughter is the distance between the Tower of Babel that people make and the New Jerusalem coming down. So this is all I'm asking. I'm not asking you to necessarily give more. I'm asking you to offer yourself 
to God in, in prayer, and then uh, to be willing to do whatever he asks you to do, and no matter what, don't stop laughing. Now, why don't you stand up for the benediction? And I hope you stick around for lunch, okay, because it should be good. I think they're out there working on it right now. All I'm saying is what? Believe the gospel. <laughs> Amen.